we tend to look at friendship as a sort of means of conspiracy, essentially. And so I think in, ter- in practical terms, I think this sort of politics of love is a politics of, of friendship and of extending and increasing. It's easier, someone once said, to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. But it's clear that we're weak in might. Systems of this complexity. Cultural systems. Economic systems. Machines of this complexity. Surely we could make a world that could first meet those needs I described and everyone should have, and then perhaps meet needs that people have only dreamed of, like the need for some autonomy and freedom. The need for that little space up there, the eye part, to expand a little bit. Just a little. Just a little. Just a little. The socialism that could engage with the yearnings and dreamings and Miles Davis music. An aesthetic dimension. Radically incompatible with everyday life under capitalism. Hey all, hi, it's Mike from the Acid Left, back here with my regular co-host Adam Ray Adkins and Admin 1 and 2 from the clandestine unit for imaginary research. It's the second time they've been here. They spoke with just Adam a few months ago. They're from Colombia, based in Salamanca and Valencia in Spain. And they have a new book coming out in PDF form called Text with Implicit Mobility. And it should be out when we publish this uh, podcast. So it'll be just beneath the podcast on YouTube. You'll see the link there. One thing I want to start with, actually, and you can maybe talk about this and then kind of lead into something more general about your your kind of motivation for this really kind of interesting text, which touches a lot on subjects which we're very familiar with uh, here on the Acid Left, which we talk about a lot. One thing that really struck me is at the beginning of the book, you talk about a number of influences or you have like a credit section, which basically just says, we'd like to thank the Anderstein Unit for Imaginary Research. would like to acknowledge the following thinkers and artists. So I was just kind of interested in the people you acknowledge here. You have a list of people, including, I'm going to leave some people out, but including Marx. But then you have straight away after that, J.M.W. Turner, so the painter. He painted landscapes. And he kind of like, he did crazy stuff. Like he tied himself to the hull of a boat in a storm to try and get the kind of effect of a storm and painted that. Marcel Duchamp, ready-made artist. So the artist that invented the ready-made conceptual artist. Deleuze, Guattari, Foucault, Negri. So all people we kind of might expect, but I think, you know, good good thinkers there to have. Erwin Panofsky is actually an art historian who dealt a lot with form and why form is so important over content. And then you have John, John Baudrillard, and the Kardashians in one line. Literally, it's like him and them. And then at the end, I see Walid Rad, who's a really interesting painter. No, no, he's not a painter, sorry. He's a really interesting artist um, who I've actually written on, I think it was for Art Forum a while ago. And Hito Stahl, a uh, German artist. Um, So anyway, these are all really interesting. The way you mix up political thinkers with, mostly with artists, I have a couple of thoughts on that. One, okay, so that's just interesting the way you, you, you kind of seem committed to the role of art in terms of vocalising political initiatives. Another thing, though, is that some of these artists you mentioned are hugely tied into the contemporary art scene, and by that I mean the officialised art world, like Hito yeah. Sterl. I'm sure she won the major prize at the Venice Biennale a few years ago. Wally rad has been in some major museums and no doubt biennials etc so do you see any contradiction there how do you see you know the role of these kind of artists that are doing really well in the obviously very capitalist art world um right in terms of politics for me what was interesting about these artists wasn't so much their political engagements although you could argue that both uh hito sterile and willie rad for example are Politically, like their art practices are engaged. Walid Rad's work is all about the Lebanese civil war and its mediation, basically. I think what 
interested me most about them though and what in their pra- the reason their practices informed the 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 work is more in the sense of how they relate to reality as a medium and so i think part of our proposal is that art has since the avant-garde been deterritorializing in a sense claiming new grounds that have left behind um representative art under you know like david for example like that that sort of art it's left it behind and and this um this momentum or this flight i think today in the contemporary art world is is actually it, the contemporary art world tries to re-territorialize it bring it back where actually what i think would be more interesting is if we followed this 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 line of flight to its logical conclusion which in my or in our view is that art must coincide with the real with the real world i think duchamp himself uh, a major figure in this context there are other uh, artists in that list that i think also take on this idea probably one of the bigger inspirations is the luther blissett project which are a, they were operating in the 90s and were involved in performances or that were basically media stunts that were recuperated by large newspapers and were basically i would say it's like a uh fake news as art practice basically which i think is very I think I mean I think this is where we would the direction we would like to take in a sense. I see this connection that you're making with the theorist and artist as well expressed by like the situationist international and Guy Debord or they would say something like the abolition and realization of art itself. But on top of that I notice this connection that can be drawn between art and capital, the dominion of capital itself, the way that it further and further commodifies things, always seeks for new things to be commodified and commodifiable. So with that, you know, we now have capitalism trying to commodify our attention and our unconscious, which is something we've talked about and is heavily throughout your book this reach towards the attention of the individual it's not enough to for them to buy something they have to be actively engaged in this way which affects their whole psychic process well i think well there, there's a there's a part we i think we have included in the in the book which is a um, special dedication to whomever uh, lost uh, love and lust i think it's called Actually, I, we, we speak there a little bit about the languages that are not, are, are not spoken by, 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 by the capital because there are like some sort of languages that he cannot like understand on its, on its, on its core, on its essence. It's always something that is... You couldn't even name it. As well. You know, it's something like... It's, it's something, it, it goes beyond the, 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 even the limits of language. The idea is to find anything that, 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 that operates in um, some sort of a different logic. For example, um, Tarkovsky, the famous uh, uh, cinema director, uh, he speaks about the uh, poetic logic. He says it's different than dialectical logic, for example, where you just uh, take something, you make the, 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 the simple thesis, uh, antithesis, synthesis, you know, that's, that's the dialectical way of, of thinking and approach uh, reality. But he also says that poetical logic is like a way of, I don't know, I, I understand it as a, as a more of a synthesis, 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 you know, it's something that happens, it just like emerges without the, without, without the need of something previous, you know, it was like a, like a beautiful birth, which, which that's what actually like, it's like the, the big bang, you know, like there are some sort of, of big bangs and expansions happening everywhere. 
and th that's why we, we say that the earth is like this like the biggest museum ever you know like like a, a something very stupid as a sunset or as a plant is the the very expression of of the sublime actually because we are very interested in in differentiating the divine from the divinity what is divine is is, is different than the concept of of divinity i think it's like a crystallized concept is like a like static concept it has a very 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 uh, like bad connotations we can say it that, that tend to, to 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 help and create some some very catastrophic results and and this sort of of the idea of divine is is more like plural it's very personal as well but it's also very collective yeah i'm aware i'm aware very much of this notion of artists maybe taking the divine off its pedestal and that, yeah. that is that is a function of Duchamp uh, and maybe not the whole not, not all of the audience will be with us yeah. here but Duchamp basically began in the early part of the last century declaring objects to be art yeah. so he took like, a bottle rack and a urinal oh, the urinal is complicated because it's thought that maybe it wasn't originally him actually yeah. who declared the urinal it was a it was an aristocratic artist woman I think she must have been in New York at the time because he was living in New York at the time. But anyway, Duchamp is a French artist who ended up in New York and started declaring objects to be artworks. And his kind of theory yeah. was that one can just take an object and call it art if you're an artist. And he did kind of stipulate that you yeah. had to be an artist to do this. Yeah. And he would basically, yeah, but I mean, the famous one is the urinal. So basically there was this kind of open um, submission exhibition in New York. And he was on the panel of the people who called the open submission exhibition. And the idea was that anything that got submitted would be displayed. And then this urinal turned up and he and he ended up, well, he actually ended up saying that he had been the one who submitted the urinal. So this kind of thing that you go to the toilet in, in the men's bathroom, you know, basically pissed in. He ended up saying that he submitted it to test the panel. But it's since been thought, and maybe in actual fact, it was um, a friend of his who submitted it um it's classic i mean because this thing the whole thing is the debate now is that we should recognize a woman who actually submitted the urinal or not duchamp who took credit for it later on and actually made that into a famous artwork that now exists as i think six or seven replicas in museums across the world yeah um but actually and, actually thanks to a yeah. to a to a to, to a friend i learned that duchamp is, is kind of hated and, and loved for the wrong reasons because uh, she, she, she once told me that actually Duchamp, at the end of his life, he, he managed to, to live by being an artist. You know, like he sold uh, a lot of his work. But at the same time, he really took very far the idea of, of becoming an artist because he also started like studying the stars and like learning uh, astronomy and making like some inventions. Well, I mean, the thing, the thing about him managing to make money off art, not really. I mean, he would have made a lot eventually or possibly at points. But he had a stipend from his family. They, it was a wealthy family. They actually had a few artists, and he basically got bankrolled by his by his parents. So he had that kind of level of privilege. But then in, in his later life, I think he wanted money. And after taking several decades out and playing chess, uh, he actually <laughs> literally gave up art to play chess. He authorized replicas to be made of some of his most famous works, among them the urinal that we were talking about. So now if you go to several museums in the world, you can see the urinal. It's in Tate Modern, it's in Niam, uh, Galleria Nazionale di Arte Moderna, in Rome, in Italy, and there are some others. But I think he was just cashing in. And the, th the funny thing was, where, you know, originally they were rebellious and unique pieces, they're now replicas that are worth a lot of money. So it kind of ruined the original concept but the theory now is that it was made the original fountain urinal was submitted to this open exhibition by baroness elsa von freitag loringhoven which is why i don't remember her name ever why should i remember <laughs> it so baroness elsa von freitag loringhoven but in any case i think the, the debate here is an important one because if it was made by women and not by duchamp i think at this point we should credit her purely well, because it's her, but also because women are not credited enough in the history of art. But I think, you know, beyond that, the piece is important because what he basically, he or she, sorry, did was said that, you know, artistry is not in, you know, trying to render an image from the Bible or from Greek myth. 
you know, expertly on a canvas or a fresco or whatever, you know, art can be anything. So they're trying to take the attention away, you know, from pointing to the mythical or biblical so. figures from, from transcendental existence and trying to, and the artist, and trying to point it at an object. And then you get from that to what you were saying, which is why I went through this whole thing, because you were saying that there's something in everyday experience. The, the, the process perhaps has been one of going from trying to make artworks that lead to transcendental experience and lead up ultimately to God, so away from life, uh, of, of taking it away from that and trying to make art something that can exist anywhere. And it's more about putting our attention onto whatever thing. And then the ultimate conclusion of that, I believe, would be that that the transcendental is really something every day that exists in, exactly. the kind of, in a relationship between us and whatever we're looking at. Yes, or, or precisely. Considering. I think the, your work is valuable and your your text, your PDF book does point to this. In it, you know, you kind of sense that in it. It's a, it's a little bit Nietzschean. I would say definitely worth reading because it's very unusual in our times. Uh, I think these kind of things actually, you know, begin to exist because... Uh, publishing online PDFs um, or other kind of forms of independent publishing are becoming more and more common. So there's a possibility of returning to these kind of texts, which you know might not be considered by academia. You know, like Nietzsche had to self-publish at points himself. I think Instagram's kind of feeding in a bit to, or, or to, you know, to, to auto-publishing, self-publishing, like we see with um, that guy, what's his name, who copied my book name? Oh, Academic Ac Fraud. Academic Fraud, yeah, yeah, like, like we see with Academic Fraud. So it's an interesting kind of thing feeding in from meme culture into into these kind of independently published texts. You know, it allows for a certain amount of um, honesty that you might not get with, you know, big publishing companies. There's one bit I just want to briefly mention. It's at the very beginning. The very opening is unsure whether or not we've arrived too late to the party. We set our pens to paper with a humble conviction that there is something here. Then it carries on in that vein. Our most basic position, going to, to another later paragraph, to start, our most basic position is a position of life. So I just like that um, affirmation, which is what seems to me to be very Nietzschean. And it appears to me to be kind of contrary to the the culture of doomerism uh in cells and to edgelordism and i think again of um instagram and meme cultures there and how everyone is very kind of black pilled not even in the incel sense but just in the general sense deeply negative um and yeah. it looks like it's you know it looks like you're kind of positioning yourself a bit against that in the beginning but then later on you've got this text um i think it's called getting joker pill right at the end and then you seem to suggest some affinity with online cultures that have grown up around the recent joker film and actually the previous joker film there was already a kind of meme culture around it and it's just kind of like the bleakness of that film and the embracing of a certain type of madness um so i'm not quite sure actually where you stand so are you all for affirmation or more for like a desperate, you know, becoming joker? We definitely are, we are on the side of affirmation and of life. In fact, I think part of this, part of one of the spirits of the book, I think could be summarized as a request to the audience to, in the, in, in the, in the meme language, to go and touch grass, basically, to experience the poetry of the world. And, um, in, on the other hand, we I think we believe that um, a lot of the doomerism is the result of a psychological warfare that is being waged against us. Every every single crisis and every news of crisis is to the power that be's advantage in making us feel helpless and so on. So. I think there is a the sense that we shouldn't pay too much attention to, to the constant uh, reminder that the world is en is ending or will end. I think we part from the position that, in a sense, the uh, the apocalypse has already occurred. We live in a civilization that has already um, hollowed itself out and is basically uh, simulating its own survival. That, I think um, that's one position. When it, more specifically, when it comes to being Joker pilled, there is there's this idea that of exodus of people simply instead of 
instead of engaging with the society, they've decided to to leave it. And that that exodus or that sort of sin, sort of this force of dispersal, which is how I think about it, it's not necessarily revolutionary as the text says, but it is, I think, necessary. And and as more elements in our supposed society uh, polarize and ethical differences become mm, qualitatively more real than a sort of this sort of Pax Americana, Pax Liberancies or whatever you want to call it is untenable. This sort of illusion of normality that is reserved for Western societies. I think it's important that it that it be destroyed, basically. Okay, it was just where you, you imply some kind of level of um, intention there from... I mean, it was kind of like, I'm reading between the lines of what you said, but some level of intention from, like, the powers that be, you know, to be very kind of simplistic. Where does the intention come in? So you're saying, like, there's a kind of level of disinformation or confusion and general negativity. Or um, over information. Over information, yeah. Yeah. So, so this how idea is that, that being used and who's using it? And is there because I mean I mean I, I say the same thing in a recent in my recent book. Uh, which I've plugged everywhere, so I'm not gonna plug it much right now, but um in uh, this book called The Meaning of the Mark, Mark Fisher, Mark I talk about this kind of level of disinformation coming via memes and how it's kind of instrumentalized. But you know, to what level is that deliberate? And then right. who is kind of pushing that? I I mean I think on I think the way we're talking about it is more in the sense of we are constantly being reminded of I don't know say the climate apocalypse every day there's a new story oh the ice the international committee on whatever is saying that actually you know it's not going to be 1.5 degrees Celsius in 1.2 and that, uh, you know, we only have 10 years to figure things out and leaders are useless and so on and so on and so on. I think this constant bombardment of information telling us that there is no future basically is not meant to empower us. Also, this this bombardment, as Admin one said, is also is also due to, to, to a very big big and, and catastrophic crisis happening right now which is not actually being discussed as much as the economic crisis for example or the climate crisis uh, which is I think is a crisis of, of presence a crisis in the in the in the most simple cognitive ways we approach reality and and, and as well and, and, and as we approach ourselves as well this, this bombardment actually, I think, operates in a similar way that the um, the, the, the the Buddhist codes of um, of dressing. A lot of religious uh, movements uh, dress in a certain way because uh, they they wear themselves uh, with reminders. A reminder is a is something that reminds you that you you must live a certain way. You know. Which, uh, which is the way of Allah, or the way of the Buddha, or the way of uh, whatever it is. But it's actually it's a reminder, I mean, objects and, and the images, that, that's why you surround yourself of reminders. And maybe you need a lot of reminders to, 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 to understand that you have to live a peaceful life and etc. But those reminders, actually this idea of the reminder, is, is very similar in how ads are being targeted to us, and how information is being targeted to us in a way that they, they don't remind us anything. It's just like a very violent gesture and very violent attack against our against so many fucking things because actually it's, a, it's, a, it's an attack made in the name of, of the capital. So I think it's one of the, the, the most disgusting uh, things capitalism has, has done. You know, this, this sort of invisible war and very hypocrite war against practically everything. Wow, yeah, that's bringing up a lot of thoughts for me. Like the Buddhist notion of you're, you're already dead in this sense that you will die. And if time is on this non-linear mode, in a sense, you're already dead. Your death is predetermined uh, in the sense that you will die. 
So the purpose of that being that the purpose of taking that kind of thought on is to alleviate the fear of death because you don't have to fear it. It is an inevitability, which is something we've actually covered in one of our video essays with Rick Roderick. And also, uh, that is a, a wonderful song by the Akron family. Don't be afraid, you're already dead. And I think that can be connected with this fear of over-information. Um, in the sense that really what's wrong with this over-information and the constant bombardment about news of the upcoming apocalypse is it's not acting in a warning way. It's not acting in a way that allows for an outside or an escape to it. It almost acts in a hyperstitional way where it's creating the very future that it's presenting. Um, instead of, if we looked at it like, like this Buddhist example of being already dead, the apocalypse has already happened. And if you look at it that way, it does allow for the possibility of subverting the worst of that said apocalypse, right? It makes me think a little bit actually of Cornell West, the American uh, theologian, democratic socialist. Uh, he was in the Matrix movies. But, you know, he has this saying, and it's something along the lines of that it's impossible to be an optimist, yet he remains a prisoner of hope. That hope there, that radical hope that's accepted apocalypse, death, etc., allows for a flourishing of life that worrying doesn't allow. You know, in, in, instead of creating this awful future, this allows for a reclaiming of life, a reappreciation. And, um, you know, a, a, as you say, it allows for one to go out and touch grass. <laughs> and then I think we could tie all of that together with what y'all in the in the book refer to as critical metaphysics so if, if you would like to tie that in and maybe talk about critical metaphysics some i think that would be helpful i think we are from the basic idea that the biggest lie that could be sold to us right now is that this society is worth saving in the first place i don't know to say some very bakunish one of seeing at least on my side and this this yes idea of destruction as a power as a, as a power of creation i'm curious then if there's anything worth saving and how do we find what that is in the book you talk about creating common terrain and common language but how do we figure out that how do we build towards that and how do we build towards affirmation and touching grass if there is nothing to save where does that impetus come from uh, actually uh, from my, my my personal view um, I don't know if you know uh, uh, what's the name what's her name uh, it's like a, a, she makes poetry and she is a Palestinian there's this girl she's an activist and he has a very beautiful poem called uh, um, we we teach life uh, well it, it's a it's a it's a very 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 beautiful beautiful poem um, uh, and it's in response to to all the criticism from the from the liberal media and and all the mainstream media uh, to, to Palestinians saying that why do you teach hate to your children wouldn't everything would be easier if you did not uh, choose cho choose just to teach hate and basically, the poem says that Palestinians wake up every day, even after they have lost everything for for years, for, and they wake up every day and they teach the rest of the world life. That, that's actually the idea of that poem. It's a very beautiful poem. I I, I recommend you you guys to, to check it. And um, I actually have this this very personal feeling that that every everyone, or at least myself, I grew in some sort of Occupied territory, you know, like um, 
this world that it's not actually this world that has been like kind of imposed to me in a very and, and imposed to not just me just I, I see in in, in 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 my mom's face I see in my friends' faces I see in in the in the in the in the in the birds I see in the in the in the in the animals I see in the in the in the wild this idea that I've, that I've, that we've grown in in occupied territory but even even after that actually we came from from a very violent violent country a country that's been in civil war for for many many years and even though we're in the city uh, actually my mom work every 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 year from since i was like i don't know since i was like 15 years at least working with uh, with with the uh, communities in civil war in problems with guerrillas in problems with with paramilitarism and uh, and and even after that she, she still being like the kindest woman ever and and she says that people still smiling everywhere and that life is just i don't know <laughs> you you cannot stop that from happening love it's 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 like gravity you know it's like this sort of force that sustains reality i don't know if yeah, I don't, yeah yeah sorry I, I, to interrupt but i wanted to come in i wanted to come in because you started talking about love but before that because i think it was already interesting what you were saying is it's very specific to your to your background in in colombia so we can maybe ask you how you see things differently to us um i was already going to ask about this because it at the very end of the book, you talk about uh, the left failing and, and you, you attack the left um, in a way that's not uncommon for leftists. But sometimes people look at leftists attacking leftists and they decide that you must be right wing or you must be like red brown or suffer from some horse, horseshoe syndrome, if you see what I mean. That you maybe, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't think that, you know, when I, when I see this, I didn't assume that. Um, but I, was, I wonder where you were going with it. And then at the end, you um you say that we must employ love to love beautifully is an act of sabotage for empire yeah for this very reason we propose a communism driven by the necessity of love over other necessities now that's like really important and i'm sure that uh, you know as the acid left um and also being deeply influenced by kind of marxist trends that are not purely about economics but which consider culture as well we see like a necessity of embracing um, aspects other than the materialism um, and that also yeah. can can be spirituality can be elements related to psychedelia to psychosis you know to many experiences that aren't accounted for fully by yeah by the reality um, but then you know if one starts saying well let's just like employ love there's people who are going to say well that's kind of a bit it's a bit vague or how's it going to work and then and, and it's very easy for them to then to then ignore us you know um, I mean, I've had that even when you know, I've been talking about very clear links between culture and materialism. That you know, there is no such thing as like either one subscribes to the idea that everything Precisely. is run by the, by the economy, or it must be run by culture. The right. two things are interlinked. Um, but I've you know I've been saying that to people and still had them being kind of like you know or being quite patronising about the idea of a revolution led again through a countercultural movement. Uh, through a street movement, etc., the kind of movement you would imagine would talk about love, like the movements of the 60s and 70s. Um, but you've been through some very difficult points. So actually, most of the people I've spoken with, who have been kind of doubting the possibility of a, of a counterculture and a revolution led by counterculture, kind of have been growing up in Britain and America, kind of privileged and also kind of you know effectively part of the states that are, are responsible for a lot of the terrible things. That happened in the world. Um, from your very different perspective, you know, why are you embracing this kind of uh, attitude, uh, which I would call basically an acid communist one? And how do you think it will work in practice? And how much does that kind of come about from your experience? Uh, okay, um, since you spoke about about our past and our, our from our our, our our home country, I, I actually. Uh, if I would say that um, what actually radicalized me b back in the days, because we all have like a very, very important text or 
or I don't know, maybe it was just like scrolling Tumblr and then you see some some anarchist or communist quote and then you are like, whoa, that's that's deep and, and, and you start digging in that. But actually, um, my radicalization, if you can call it that way, uh, became, I don't know, I remember I was like, maybe like seven years old. I was, I was very young. I was not even a teenager. And I remember my mom telling me about the work she was doing the work with the with the Colombian peasants and um, and uh, and how to to, to 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 it was a very 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 difficult process she was having because she was working in a, in a war zone actually and uh, I remember she just saying telling me like uh, we without, without even acknowledging what what she was saying because she was speaking to a, to a, to a little kid but actually she said very very seriously even to herself that the, the the only thing i think that can make people to change things is to to to, to get arms you know like uh, arming them which is which is like some sort of my, my mom has never read lenin ever you know she has no idea of marxist leninism but but seeing her advocating for 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 that in such a logical and and just a moral way because actually you're arming yourself to defend yourself so is your is your right is more is even your divine right because you're going to protect your brothers from 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 the evil forces if you want to call it that way so actually we really defend love but at the same time we we understand the the the, the problem of of violence and I, i even understand the idea that you can make a rageous and and, and courageous and onerous war against the forces of evil if you're fi fighting for for love because i actually every uh, a thing that inspired us to write actually are the 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 movements for liberations uh from the from the south american priests you know priests uh, um, christian priests that, that were that were theology of liberation. theologists theology of liberation exactly And they were uh, they were arming the peasants. They were uh, calling to, to to general insurrections. They were calling to expropriation of of the lands of the church, expropriation of churches. And actually, a lot of of of, of Catholic priests have been killed in in South America, everywhere in El Salvador, in Brazil, in Colombia, because they preach that that idea. So. I mean, being in the position of love and, and saying that love is the most important thing also means that you, 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 I mean, it's a very big sentence, you know, it's like a very, you have to have the means and, and you have to, to have the force or at least the, 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 the will to, to defend what love is and to be at, at the, the, the that, that you deserve love and to fight in his name. I don't know how to say it. What you're saying here reminds me of this saying turn the other cheek as Zizek and others have interpreted it, is that while it is often said to be this saying of pacifism to turn the other cheek as in rejecting the violence that was done upon you he goes out of his way to point out the the wording of it which implies that it is the back of the hand which is striking you, not the front of the hand, not, a, not, not the palm. And to be hit with the back of the hand is a sign of that the person being struck is of a lower social class. And that by turning the other cheek, you would be inviting the slap from the palm. So that in and of itself is a very violent act because it demands equalization. It, it says, treat me as an equal. It, it rejects the master-servant relationship that being struck with the back of the hand implies. So, in that case, it's actually a very violent act because it's a violence against the very social order that the system is relying upon. But it's also one of love because that is... Uh, the ultimate act of love, which is an equalizing force, does present itself to a system that's built on domination as an ultimate violence. 
which I think is uh, also why Zizek points out that Christ says he comes with a sword. Um, exactly. If I could also, if I could also answer the question in, I think in another sense, uh, perhaps more theoretically, in the in the sense that I think our text um, it treats friendship as a as a political relation in the sense that I th- what allows friendship, which is recognition of of equality and and which and of love of course which permits it is is in fact a very powerful force because we 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 tend to look at friendship as a sort of means of conspiracy essentially and so i think in term in practical terms i think this sort of politics of love is a politics of of friendship and of extending complicities I've seen, um, I mean, there's a lot of interpretations of the turning the other cheek, and it became quite a thing um, interpreting that very passage. Or it has been, you know, it's been a recurrent thing um, throughout the history of philosophy. Uh, But I know that um, Alain Badiou had been looking at this um, around the same time that Zizek was looking at it, that Christianity made a kind of comeback in philosophy in the early 2000s, I think. Also, my mum had a thing of converting to Christianity or becoming kind of a um, devout Christian when I was in my teens. So she kind of took me over, you know, took me to church and I kind of went through, you know, um, Bible reading and stuff at a very impressionable age and then got into heavy metal and a devil worshiping music at the same time. So I had this kind of moment of really looking deeply at this stuff of first taking it on board and then rejecting it. But I think for me, there is something very powerful. If you just take it as literally someone strikes your cheek and then let them strike the other one as a counteraction to the perverse logic we normally live by, if you think that the kind of greed of capitalism, or put it in more material terms, the tendency to accumulate is not entirely new, that this tendency was always there. In fact, Adorno would say that it's the part of the tendency that we have, which I always talk about, to identify and control nature and, and, and therefore also people around us. I think the discussions we were having while writing the book were often surrounding this idea of finding the, the sort of the poetry that abounds in the day-to-day and sort of... Considering this a, a life and reality as a, a work of art, and it's this precisely this work of art that a war is being waged against. So speaking of finding joy and exploring your territory, I want to share a little anecdote. At the supermarket I work for, they, a number of years ago, put up a bunch of spikes around the roof, like where the awning meets the building, these metal um, metal roof type thing. And they put up all these little spikes which are anti-bird spikes. And of course, listeners of us know I'm a bird lover. You probably hear them in quite a few of the podcasts, the three that I have. Uh, so I was I was sad when they put up these bird spikes because they never bothered me. You know, the birds, there weren't that many of them, and they were kind of nice to see in the mornings. But what's happened now with all these little spikes all over the place is that we have more birds. They're just smaller. The, the little birds that live there, the little finches and stuff, see these spikes as perches and they play on them they hop on them around and around and I really love that I was happy to see them come back and I find it like a a kind of a poetic humor in the fact that there's more birds now and they're having so much fun so I, I see this relation I think it could speak to some of the themes in the book that you bring up it's this way that what was built to destroy the natural world in some ways has enhanced it. You know, it's been recolonized by a force of life, um, which, yeah, just seeing all of them play, I, it, it looks really fun sometimes. I wish I could hop from little tiny perch to little tiny perch and duck in and out of them. I think that's like a concrete <laughs> that's awesome. example. A concrete example of what Admin 2 was saying earlier when he said, 
that there are languages or logics at play that escape the sort of the techno rationality of capital, for example. That there are there are forms that are can that overcome, you know. As I w- I mean, I've been reading a thousand plateaus recently, and this idea of straighted versus smooth space, and so I think at times. Straighted space is actually quite at a loss when it comes to sort of languages that escape it. Yeah, actually,、uh, I want to say that I always thought that that、uh, from 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 the the militant side of politics、uh, actually is a is a. Is a way of being in the world that's very similar to 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 the to to the artist. I, I would say that because when you're a, a, a militant and you you have like political goals, for example, let, let's say we want to to, to 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 make communism happen, you know. So your life actually goes around the question of constantly asking yourself, how do I do it? How do I make the revolution possible? How do I I I, I, I create this? And actually, the artist goes, or the philosopher as well, goes constantly asking, asking like, why? Why is this? Why, 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 why this is here? Why this? And actually, there are there are some very similar intensities,、mm, but I think it can only only be 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 how do you say that? Be like integrated in both sides if we have like a language who's very like intuitive and open. That it's also a question of allowing people to speak, rather than just speaking for them or being the one that seems to be speaking. You know, I think that that I think at, at, at its best, art is something that opens people up to express themselves, and it's the same with activist politics. But I'm not sure we're seeing that very much, especially with the kind of migration of.、Um, Politics online. I mean, of course, the activists are still out there, but there's a lot happening online. So I think you know, there's kind of an obfuscation, a kind of muddying of the waters. That it seems like there's all this left-wing stuff happening, but a lot of it's actually just happening online. And I mean, of course, that is an ex- that is an example of people being empowered because there's so many of us now online making stuff, memes and videos and podcasts and what have you. I mean, that's all good. But I don't know how much we're really also like opening up, you know, everyone else to 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 speak. That 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 you know, I think a really good activist could go into the street and give the microphone to the people being affected by the problem they're talking about. So go and deal with a housing campaign and get people living in those houses who are about to lose their houses talking if they want to. You know, and often these people can be very vocal and very sharp once they are talking because they're very passionate about their own particular housing crisis, for example.、Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you know, art and activism are similar, but you know, and on and online, the online left as well, which kind of you know is not quite art or activism. You know, art, the art world doesn't really want it, and the activists are a bit suspicious of us. But、um, you know,、um, those three things are all essential, and they all have similarities. But they work best when they descend, and it's not it shouldn't be descend, but that's kind of how we look at it because we are on a pedestal often. When they go and talk to the people and get the people to make stuff and say stuff. Um, and I'm sure that that's something that you you agree with. So I can see it in your in your text. Actually, like to point out to the fact that I think the right wing has been very clever in managing to synthesize culture and, let's say, direct action or pra- praxis、uh, politics.、Um, I think like QAnon as a sort of cultural phenomenon and its real effects. On the political sphere, should be, in a sense, regarded with some respect by the left because I don't think the left has managed to even come close as to、uh, creating something, a movement like that,、uh, which has really, which has the capacity to possess people like QAnon. And I think it, it's such an interesting phenomenon because it's sort of like a 
crowdsourced meta narrative that then acts back on itself and has real implications in in the world and in politics. Well, I think the clandestine unit for imaginary research does almost fall into a left wing uh, queue. <laughs> I mean, you know, n- uh, not 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 necessarily. It doesn't seem overly conspiratorial. Although I do think there is a little bit of elements in there that you're playing with, more along the lines of uh, maybe giving an operating guide to how to go about creating something along the lines of a Q type movement amongst the left that has actual left values because of the embrace of the vitalism and the embrace of experimenting um there's an embrace of the avant-garde there it's almost like a uh situationist post QAnon type thing or situationist post digital age approach you have to take all of that into consideration here of course and the encouragement of play and i do sense a encouragement of collaboration as well throughout there which i think is really important and the people at locust review uh tish turl one of them she's documented this and really pointed out how the baking which is where the conspiracies are decided upon and where they're kind of grown you know q does these drops of really strange information you know usually almost like an abstract poem and then the community of believers go about and bake uh which is creating those drops or taking those drops and creating them into uh canon what is and is not accepted and kind of interpreting them and whatnot but that that process of baking is really alive and well so now even though the original Q is probably gone, whatever their intentions were, and Ron Watkins is perhaps most likely running it for his own scams. The community, though, is still there. They're still the ones baking, um, and they have a control over it in a way that I think both the current and original Q had no idea about and doesn't control it as much as they may wish to um or it could be more of an element so yeah i I guess i see there that that could be carried over to a project like the clandestine unit for imaginary research at least in its spirit uh obviously not in its intentions if if anything the cuir attempts at least would in a sense like would like to propose a kind of means of doing that on the left, or at least that's my that that's my perspective. I right think now. that QAnon, you know, fills a gap where where people are missing are missing a narrative, and the left need to step up and create a narrative. Um, and obviously, anonymous online kind of movements might might be a way, but it's how to like. I don't know. I mean, no one knows how QAnon spread quite like that. What, what, was there any kind of a, was there help from? Um, from people inside uh, the state or government, I don't know. Maybe it didn't need to be, but I'd suggest it partly, it partly spread how it did because of the kind of narratives being pushed and, and the human brain kind of needs to attach to these kind of narratives of power and racism, etc. Racialist narratives, narratives of blood drinking, Satanists, somehow right. this inspires something in people. And if the left don't want to go down that path, which we don't, we know we're a little well, bit stuck in, in how to get a narrative growing up like that. Right. I think, I mean, QAnon proposes a kind of right-wing metaphysics, essentially. And uh, I think what we are trying to do is to propose a left-wing metaphysics, which is, uh, it's, you know, we are in, we're inserting ourselves in a line of philosophy that obviously pre-exists us. Only we've come at a time in which you know, anonymity, the internet and all that kind of allows for maybe an artifice of aura, like in the Benjaminian sense, or, you know, create meaning out of nothing, basically. I think that's a good good place to stop. And I think that's a really good um, 
project, if I can call it project, that sounds like, you know, I don't know, a little bit official, but um, it's, a, it's a great book you have coming out, the clandestine unit for imaginary research, and you can find a link beneath this video, text with implicit mobility, and the book outlines a kind of direction for the left. Um, so thanks for being here, it's been a great talk, and I hope to follow you and hope we can collaborate in future. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Marvin. If you have been enjoying our content, please consider registering your desire with the algorithm by liking and subscribing. This really does help us grow and reach a wider community. If you would like to support our work of documenting and nurturing the rise of post-capitalist desires, become a patron. This allows us to continue research-based memes, podcasts, and videos, as well as up our production value. Patrons receive early views of videos, exclusive content, and more, including physical art and the ability to directly influence our research topics. The building of a better world happens on many fronts. Turn on, tune in, and shape a future collective reality.